As a small business owner, your to-do list is long. The Knot makes advertising easy and connects you with the right couples at the right time. Visit vendors.thenot.com slash podcast for 15% off your first month with code podcast15. Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, episode 344, interview with Jeffrey Jackson about his book, Paper Bullets, Two Artists Who Risk Their Lives to Defy the Nazis. Jeffrey Jackson, professor of history at Rhodes College, comes on to the show to tell us about Lucy and Suzanne's courage in defying the Nazi occupation of the Channel Island, Jersey. These two lovers, having developed their avant-garde artistry in 1920s and 1930s Paris, will put all their skill to work when undermining the enemy troops of their island. Professor Jeffrey Jackson, author of Paris Underwater, How the City of Light Survived the Great Flood of 1910, describes how these two courageous women's paper bullets made the Nazis question their own safety and why they were there at all. Dr. Jackson, thank you very much for being with us today. Well, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So now, as you can imagine, I've been doing this podcast for over just over 10 years, and I've run across many different types of stories of courage. And don't get me wrong, they're all impressive. But this one, I had never heard of these two ladies before. I never heard about this, this unfolding drama and their and the war that they waged on the occupiers. So um, what really impressed me is that, and again, this should never be forgotten, but your story, I think, demonstrates anybody, no matter how physically weak or frail or limiting or whatever, if they have a moral compass, when they're in a situation that they feel is wrong, their instinct is going to be, and however they can, to fight back, no matter the odds or the consequences. I think that's a really great point, and it it speaks to a couple of things about this story that really sort of appealed to me and drew me in when I when I first uh, found out about it, first started working on it. First of all, I think it's, uh, I, I sometimes talk about this as the World War II story you've never heard before. Um, <laughs> exactly. Because it's a, it's a story that really has kind of slipped through the cracks uh, for most people, don't really know anything about it. So to talk about these two women is really a great way to sort of bring uh, a different story to life and to uh, to help us to sort of uh, see the war from a different perspective. But then I think, as you say, you know, the, the, the moral element, the human element, um, and to think about uh, what they did, the risks that they took, and they, uh, especially given who they were um, and the kinds of things that were at stake for them, right. um, it was really sort of remarkable. And so whenever I've spoken about this story to audiences or on interviews like this one, I, 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 it, there's really just a sense of, of how inspirational their story is. Absolutely. Abs- yeah, so you and I were talking before we started recording, and I was telling you that you know, my father was in the Air, Air Force, so I've lived practically the first 16 years of my life on Air Force bases, and then we moved mm-hmm. out to the country. So very simple existence. And I just have to say, probably because of that, the first half of your book, where your, your you know, exposition, you're setting up the story, I fell in love with that all on its own merit, just because it's, it's 1920s Paris. It's one of the, the, the centers of culture and learning and progressive thinking. And um, I know that you have to write that part of the book to get to the other part, but I, that first part all on its own, I absolutely loved it. Thrilled me. I felt like I was in Paris sitting at a little table, having these (laughs) great discussions with these people. And of course, pushing all the boundaries, which we're going to get into in a moment. But if you could for us to set up this, uh, the story, can you introduce us to Lucy and Suzanne and maybe tell us a little bit about their lives in 1920s Paris? Sure. And, and thank you for the compliment. I'm glad you, you found that to be such a vibrant, uh, mm-hmm. vibrant part of the book. Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, their, their backstory is that um, Lucy and Suzanne, Lucy Schwab and Suzanne Malherbe, mm-hmm. uh, they were born in Nantes, which is a, a city in the southern part of France. Um, I always talk about them as daughters of wealth and privilege because Lucy's father was a newspaper owner and editor, and Suzanne's father was a a prominent physician and head of the medical school Mm. in Nantes, and her grandfather had also had that same position as head of the medical school. So so they came from very wealthy and prominent backgrounds, 
Um, but uh, they discovered both of them, um, at their uh, life together as artists. They were both uh, artists. They, they were creators. Um, and so it makes sense that they would move to Paris uh, because Paris, as you say, in, in the 1920s, right after World War I, uh, was a vibrant place. Of course, it was also still recovering from the war. It took many years to recover right. from World, World War I. There was a recession right after the war. Um, but uh, it was also a place for new beginnings for a lot of people. A lot of people moved to, to, to the big city uh, oh. after the war, and, um, and they, were, uh, they were part of that. And so as artists, as creators, uh, they were able to plug into the this really kind of amazing scene. They had some connections to it already because Lucy's uncle was also a famous writer and uh, he had sort of opened some doors for them even earlier on uh, when they used to travel to Paris to visit with him. Right. Um, and, and his wife was an actress. And so they had entree into a lot of these, these scenes, but they moved to Paris and, and made a new life and, and they opened up their home. Uh, they created a, a, a space inside of their apartment where they would invite writers and artists and musicians and poets and others to come and, and spend time with them. Mm -hmm. They would go and visit with others, their uh, famous bookstores in Paris, where they would go and hang out with uh, other members of the artistic scene. Um, and uh, of course, they were also partners. I mean, they were a couple. They were a lesbian couple. And so they, there was, uh, that was a whole other scene that they were able to plug into um, and to, to kind of find uh, themselves and find a social world there. Right. Um, and so, so um, they had a lot going for them um, before they left Paris and went to Jersey in 1937. But it, it, you're right. It, it's, it's such an amazing part of their story. If, even, if, even if they hadn't been involved in resisting the Nazis during the war, just that part of their life alone would make it a fascinating biography. Um, but of course, it's also the backstory to what they go on to do uh, later on in life. Right. Now, when they're in Paris, I know that one, obviously, like you said, they come from money, so they don't have to work. But it's not like they're just laying around. They are involved in a lot of creative projects. They had a favorite camera. They would take pictures and they would there was some writing going on as well. Um, and what of course, now looking back, the great irony is here's two young women who are trying to find themselves. They have the convenience of living in Paris uh, in the 1920s for the most part. You know, I'm sure they had they had wonderful times. But the very hobbies that they're doing with with different types of media and different types of art is going to be the very thing that they're going to turn into a weapon against one of the most powerful forces this planet has ever seen. So I just enjoyed that. Oh, here's this nice little innocent creative thing that we do part time. And it's going to become so much more menacing in a good way for them later mm -hmm. on in the story. That's right. I think um, the fact that they were creative people, uh, they didn't know it, but in a mm -hmm. sense, they were in training. Um, to fight the Nazis. There was no way they could have known that. Right. But um, but the, the types of skills, the types of uh, creative work that they did, uh, and you're right, it was it was varied. Um, Lucy really was a writer primarily, mm -hmm. um, and Suzanne was an illustrator. But together they collaborated on photography, and that's what they sort of later on and nowadays have actually become sort of famous for. Right. Um, they, took, they took these new names, these artistic names, while they were in Paris. Um, Lucy became known as Claude Cahoon, and uh, Suzanne became known as Marcel Moore. Right. And sometimes you'll, you'll see the, those names uh, used to refer to them. Um, and certainly folks within the art world who study their, their artwork, and, and even you'll, you'll find it in major museums around the world, mm -hmm. um, it's credited to their artistic names, Claude Cahoon and Marcel Moore. But those photographs that they made, they were very challenging photographs. They were very, uh, some people even, you know, look at them and say that they're weird or ugly. Right. Uh, but they were really trying to play with ideas about beauty, about gender, about, um, you know, what constitutes art mm -hmm. uh, in this in this period. Um, but I think all of that kind of mixed media work that they were doing, you know, blending art and photography and drawing, um, all of that would become a kind of training ground, again, unknown to them, right. but it would be a set of skills that they would uh, put to use when they ended up fighting against the Nazis. Right. And out of everything that you explored in this part of your book, and I'm going to paraphrase here, Lucy is talking to someone because obviously these two women are together together. 
Some elements of Paris are going to be accepting. Some elements of Paris are not going to be accepting. And later on, when they're on the Channel Islands, their new German masters, you know, are not going to be uh, as accepting. So in some ways, they almost have to hide themselves or, or flaunt themselves if they want to shock everybody. But there was Lucy was talking to someone and she basically says something that is so simple but so profound. And I think we've lost it And nowadays. And she's basically basically like... I'm trying to figure me out what makes me happy. And if I'm not hurting you while I'm doing that, then you shouldn't have any problem or try to limit me. And that's what they were doing. They were literally trying to figure out who they were as individuals and as a couple. I think that's right. That time in Paris um, was, was, as you say, they were young. It was part of their youth. It was part of of their creative exploration. Um, And it was a, a time and a place that, allowed them and gave them the space to do it. And of course, as you've said, they, they also had the money, the sort of the luxury of being able to do that. Um, but I think uh, a lot of their work, and that's part of what many people find appealing about their, especially their photography now, because yeah. it blurs so many lines and, and bends the rules in so many ways. Um, it's, it really is a, a kind of self-exploration. Um, and I think as they're trying to figure themselves out, one of the things that they I don't know that they consciously come to think about it this way, but right. they they certainly come to act in a way that they really are resistors. Um, and that's mm-hmm. true in their Paris days, and that will become true later on when they resist the Nazis. And so one of the ways I talk about them in this book is that they're lifelong resistors. You know, in other words, this is <laughs> exactly. not just something that they discover um, later in life when they're uh, when they're living on the Channel Islands, but rather this is something that's really been a part of them uh, for a long time. And I think it's it's because of that time that they spent in Paris um, figuring themselves out, uh, that, that they are able to learn that it's OK to push against, you know, some of the rules or to push against society um, or and to and to to do that in, in service of figuring out who you are. Right. So before we get into the meat and potatoes of the story of basically two women decide on their own in a very particular way to take on the occupiers of the Channel Islands. Before we get to that, um, how did you come to know the story of these two ladies? Uh, Was their story known for a long time or was that something that was more recent? Well, I came to it through my wife, actually, who oh. is an art is an art historian and knew about them uh, through their photography. Right. And my my wife taught a course for a number of years on the history of photography, and so they've been known in art circles and they've been known, especially in photography circles, for a while. They were really sort of rediscovered, kind of in the 1980s, I would say. Uh. Um, there was a French writer who wrote a biography of Lucy as Claude Cahun, this artistic persona that really kind of began to. Um, that was, I think, really in the early 90s. So he really that really began to sort of make her somewhat known again. Mm-hmm. Um, and then over the last you know couple decades, it's it's they've been their story has been uh, uh, their their artistic story, at least the, the Parisian part of their story has been known among folks in the art world. But even among those scholars who've who've studied them, they tend to focus only on Paris and only on the art that they produce. And they don't really talk as much about the wartime period. So it was really um, kind of a, you know, a footnote at the end of the story. Right. So when my wife showed me their their photographs, um, one night we were at home and and I don't remember exactly how it came up, but she said, you need to look at this. This is really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and I always listen to my wife and, Good. Uh, Good. and she, and I, I started looking at the photographs and I thought, yeah, this is interesting. These photographs, they're, they're challenging. They're, they're surprising. They're beautiful and weird at the same time. And right. I wanted to know more. And, and she knew a little bit about the, the wartime story. You know, she knew enough to tell me that there was something going on there. Uh, um, and so I just started looking into it. And the more I started looking into it, the more I realized that, that, you know, people who had written about them had, like I said, only, you know, maybe mentioned it kind of in a final paragraph or a right. footnote or just kind of, you know, at the end of their study, but hadn't really written much about it. So once I realized that there was, you know, first of all, an interesting story here mm-hmm. and some interesting people here, and also that really very little had been written about it, I thought, okay, this is a <laughs> this is a project I really want to pursue. And then the more I got into it, the more uh, the more ins- inspired I became and the more, um, you know, curious I became. And, and uh, I just wanted to know more. And that's that's really how it all started. Here's a question for you. What would you do to save humanity? And how far would you go to stop someone who is getting in your way? The ancient rivalry of assassins and Templars cuts to the heart of good versus evil. 
but it wasn't always clear who was good and who was evil. Plug in to explore the amazing world of medieval feuds. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars, is a special collaboration between History Hit and Ubisoft, the masterminds behind the Assassin's Creed games. Hosted by Dan Snow from History Hit and Matt Lewis from Gone Medieval, together they will take a close look at the real history of the secret societies, which inspired the Assassin's Brotherhood and the Templar Order in the Assassin's Creed games. Plus, they will bring on other premier historians as they discuss unearthing the myths of the Grail and who really was the inspiration for the main characters in the game. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars podcast is available right now wherever you get your podcasts. Listen and subscribe to Echoes of History today to discover the hidden truths that have shaped our world and inspired the video game series. That's Echoes of History wherever you get your podcasts. Listen today and subscribe for more. I, as a, as a um, father of four daughters, I'm always looking for literature or examples of strong women. So again, that's one of the reasons that drew me to this book is so I can go, you know, here, here to my daughters, here's two young ladies that, you know, stood, stood firm to themselves and they, they resisted one of the most powerful forces uh, the world has ever seen. So I certainly appreciate and I thank you for that. Mm-hmm. So let's jump into this. So as you say in the book, Lucy... Uh, again, even though they come from uh, a certain privilege, uh, she's had health issues, mental health issues as well. But so decide to get away from it all. They moved to Jersey in the Channel Islands in 1937 and they settled down into the world. They've got a decent house. I think they have someone cooking their meals, but their little slice of paradise doesn't last that long before war does come and invade into their lives. Uh, that's right. They They moved to Jersey because... It is an escape for them. Um, Paris in the 1930s has become a difficult place. The Depression, of course, is underway. Right. Um, politically, it's very divisive. Um, there are people f- literally fighting in the streets of Paris over politics. Mm. Uh, there are there are sort of French fascist and proto-fascist groups that are on the rise, um, as well as anti-Semitism. And, and we haven't talked about it yet, but Lucy's family, uh, her father's family is Jewish. Right. And they they were not uh, practicing Jews. They, they had assimilated and, and her mother was actually Catholic. Um, but uh, Lucy had come to know about her Jewish heritage from her grandmother and had embraced elements of that. Mm-hmm. And so with anti-Semitism on the rise in Paris, in addition to, as you mentioned, Lucy's health issues, physical health, as well as depression and, and mental health issues, they decided to go to Jersey because it was a place they knew. They had been there before. They vacationed there. Lucy's family had vacationed there even many years before. So it was familiar mm-hmm. territory. Uh, they spoke, both spoke English and Jersey, even though Jersey has French connections and roots and it's just, just off the Norman coast, right. it's really much more English in its culture. Um, and so they spoke uh, they spoke the language that most people on the island spoke. Um, and so, like I said, it was it was a safe and comfortable place for them. And they were there for just a few years. Um, they thought that by this point they were Lucy was 49 and, and Suzanne was 52. And um, right. they, they thought, you know, that they would kind of um, move into middle age and, and, and older years, you know, in a kind of quiet space and that um, yeah. they'd be able to paint and write and and take photographs and, you know, just kind of do the things, li- live a life of leisure, really. And right. um, it didn't didn't quite turn out that way because <laughs> it, it turned out that the Channel Islands were very attractive uh, to the German army because they were strategically uh, important. And it, and it uh, was part of what Hitler called the Atlantic Wall. The Atlantic Wall refers to this series of fortifications uh, along the Atlantic coastline, starting in in the Scandinavian countries and then moving down. And really, the Channel Islands were pretty much second on the list of priority uh, wow. in terms of building these fortifications. And so, um, uh, you know, Lucy and Suzanne had no way of knowing this, but uh, it, it, this became a very strategically important space for the German army. And so it's the only even even though um, it's the the Channel Islands are they're loyal to the British crown. They're quasi independent, but they're mm-hmm. they're considered part of, of of British territory. It's the only British territory that the Germans conquer during the war. Um, and of course, they have to adapt to that to that situation. 
Right. So I guess um, one of the first questions that Lucy and Suzanne, along with everyone else on the islands, would, would probably be asking is, why didn't Britain defend the Channel Islands? But I guess it was just beyond their means at that point. So the Channel Islands uh, were not really considered very strategically important by the British. Mm. Um, in fact, the British basically withdrew from the islands. They uh, they said, you know, well, we, we don't have the, the men or the material to be able to, to defend these islands. Um, and the assumption was that if the islands were left undefended, that the Germans would have no reason to go there, would have no reason to bomb them, would have no reason to, you know, to attack them. Right. So the the hope was that, in fact, the hope was that the, the islands might serve as a kind of vacation spot um, during the war, that wow. people who wanted to get out of London or out of, you know, the, of, of uh, British cities might still somehow be able to go to the Channel Islands for a respite. But um, the unfortunate, one of the unfortunate things that happened is that after the British withdrew from the islands, they forgot, I guess, <laughs> right. to tell the Germans that the islands were undefended. Oh. And so the German army didn't necessarily know. And and the irony is that when the German planes started flying over to mm-hmm. reconnoiter the, the uh, territory, they saw lots of trucks on the island. Um, and they thought that these trucks were, from their aerial reconnaissance, they thought these trucks were were troop movements or, right. or some other mili- military movement. It turned out they were the trucks for the potato and tomato harvest. Oh, Jesus. Um, because oh the, there's a lot of agriculture on the islands, and in particular, they grow potatoes and tomatoes. Sure. Um, and so, and there were also some very old fortifications that dated back to the Napoleonic Wars mm-hmm. um, that were still around uh, on the islands. And so uh, that was another thing that from the air, uh, they sort of looked like, you know, some kind of fortification. So, um, or some kind of active fortification. So in a funny way, even though the British thought that these would be safe, these islands would be safe, they turned out to be not only strategically important, um, but then there, there was all this confusion, you know, from the right. German perspective about what was going on <laughs> on these islands. So there is still a little, a bit of, a bit of bombing, uh, before the Germans just basically land and say, we're in charge at this point. That's right. They they do bomb and they do strafe the island, um, and uh, and then they drop leaflets and say basically you should surrender, uh, you should put up white flags, and then they they land at the airport and the the bailiff who's the that's the chief elected officer mm-hmm. um, of the island government. Um, the bailiff uh, goes to the airport and um, the German officer gets off the plane and basically, right. you know, says we're here and, and the bailiff surrenders yeah. and they shake hands. And there's really, because there's really nothing they can do. The, the island can't defend itself in any way. Right. And I think that there was also the hope on the part of the, the local government, the Jersey government, that if they cooperated, mm-hmm. that maybe life would not be too bad. Um, they spent a lot of the of the war trying to sort of work with the Germans and to and to cooperate in some way so that um, local government could go on, that could be preserved, as much of the local way of life could could uh, could happen. Right. Um, and that is a large part of what did happen. There there were there was a, a kind of active cooperation um, and. Um, and many people ended up working for the German occupation force. They they sort of had to. Uh, they didn't sure. really have much choice. But uh, but it but large numbers of people ended up working for the Germans. Right. But you make a good point. So the Germans are going to be a lot nicer to them than they are in the East, obviously. But when when the sits when the uh, phony war is over and Germany invades Western Europe, uh, you've got to think that the people on the Channel Islands still had time to make good their escape. And in fact, some do. Uh, but Lucy and Suzanne, who certainly have the means uh, to, I guess, head to Britain before the, the island is occupied, but they choose not to. Was was that was that just their home at this point or or what were they thinking? You're right. They could have escaped, and many people did. Uh, a lot of people. There were uh, there was a, a period right at the at the um, beginning of the war where uh, a lot of people left, and Lucy and Suzanne went to the to the docks, and they watched this happen, and they watched right. people try to figure out what to do with their belongings and how to deal with um. with things. And I think it was kind of distressing in a way for them. Um, they 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 actually did consider it. I mean, Lucy in particular did think about going. Mm-hmm. Um, back to France, possibly, or or maybe to Britain. Um, but I think there were a couple reasons why they didn't go. One was that they realized, first of all, that um, 
and they actually, I, I talk about it in the book, they sort of have a fight about it. Um, they basically realize there's nothing that they could do. They right. say, well, what could you do? Suzanne even says this to her, you know, with your health conditions, you know, yeah. what do you what do you think you could really do? <laughs> How could you help if we were to go to Britain and do something there? Like, or where, where, where would we go? You know what? Um, so there's a sort of the practical question. Mm-hmm. But then the other question, I think, is for Lucy is that she wants to do something to resist. I mean, as I said before, you know, that they, they are really resistors their whole lives. And so that impulse is there to do something. Right. And later on, it's it's only later in life that she sort of reflects on this, but um, she realizes that that Jersey is the place where they have, as she puts it, the luxury of resistance. Uh, because if they had gone to France or if they had gone to Britain, they couldn't really have done any of the kinds of things that they ended up doing. And so in a funny way, the only place that they really could be involved in some kind of active resistance against the Germans was to do it on Jersey, to stay there. And so... They make this decision, you know, partly for practical reasons, but partly, I think, for um, reasons of, of wanting to do something. And this is really the place that they kind of decide to take their stand. This is the place where we can do this work. Right. So, and, and I love that about Lucy. When you look at the photos in your book, and there's some brilliant photos in there, I mean— she's frail and she's physically ill and she's got emotional issues that she's dealing with. And, but, but it's her, she's the one going, no, we're going to find some way to stick it to these guys to, to try to be a cog in the wheel. What, I mean, whatever. I mean, it's coming from her and Suzanne is like, okay, yeah. Uh, because they love each other. They're going to be together no matter what. But, but the, mm-hmm. but the internal fire in Lucy was something that kept impressed. And it's not over with yet. There's going to be many instances of her just, if she feels like something's wrong, she's going to want to fight back. And that was very admirable. Yeah, she's she's definitely the one. Lucy's the one who who comes up with the the not so much the plan, but but I think you're right. The fire. It's it's the the kind of the desire to do something. Um, and Suzanne, you know, this is sort of speaks to them as a couple in a way. You know, mm-hmm. Lucy is kind of the is the passion, and Suzanne was the practical one. She was the <laughs> one to sort of figure out how can we you know, do this in a, in a pragmatic way. And so it really is, it, it's born out of the, the relationship. It's born out of the two of them, the back and forth, the, the discussions and the fights, even, like I said, that they have, um, that, that I tried to recount in the book because they, they, they're still, you know, in the, in the documents that I looked at in the records, you know, they, they themselves recount this, <laughs> some right. of these, these fights and things that they have over these issues. But, but Lucy really wants to do something. And so um, Suzanne at first does have to sort of be convinced to mm-hmm. participate. But once she does, and once she buys into this, once she she uh, agrees, Suzanne is all in. I mean, she she becomes right. the one often to do some of the more risky uh, uh, resistance work that they do. And so, um, you know, it's it really is a partnership. And I think that yeah. was true about their art back in the Paris days. These really were yeah. collaborative pieces. And it's something that's true about their, their um, resistance as well. Right. So right before we jump into... Lucy and Suzanne waging war against the Nazis on on the Channel Islands. Just one last question to set it up. I mean, I I get that they're upset that their their peaceful life has been disturbed, but these two ladies have have a lot to hide. There's a, there's many reasons for them to not get the attention or to do anything to arouse the suspicion of the German masters on their island of Jersey, and yet they're going to do it anyway. That's right. They they do have a lot of things that probably, you know, if you, if you sat back objectively and said, you know, should, should these people be involved in any sort of dangerous risk-taking work? You know, the answer would be no. There are a lot of, there's a checklist of, of reasons why they shouldn't have been. Like I said, Lucy's family, her father's family was Jewish. Mm -hmm. Um, They were a lesbian couple, which also is not something looked upon kindly by the Nazis. They were involved in this this artwork that they had produced, this, this avant-garde, you know, very shocking in many ways art, um, was the kind of art that the Nazis referred to as degenerate art. Right. Um, and they, they, they had uh, undertaken efforts in Germany to make fun of and to mock modern art. Um, and, um, and so, you know, there were there, and also that they were, they were foreigners. I mean, they were French res French citizens residing in exile or in mm. or sort of expatriates, I guess you would say, but they were residing in this British territory. So that made them potentially suspicious. You know, what are they doing here? They're outsiders that, you know, um, <clears throat> so, um, 
and then of course as the war goes on they they have a secret radio that they're listening to wow. um you know they're hoarding food <laughs> uh, yeah. which many people were doing but but they they they're already doing certain things uh, so who they are is is risky some right. of the just just resist or some of the the day to day activities that they do just to survive is risky, and then you add on to this this resistance that they do, um, and that you know just really sort of increases their risk level through the roof, and yet they continue to do it. So let's jump into some of their acts of defiance or acts of risk um, risks uh, resistance as well. Uh, give us an idea of what some of what they were doing as they would go about their various locations on the island. So the main way that they that they resist, and and this is one of those things that it seems like a small thing, right? Uh, but it turns out to be a really big thing, at least um, from the German perspective. I mean, we can talk more about why it, it's such a big deal, but um, but basically what they do is they they spread notes, they write notes, mm-hmm. um, and they most of these notes they type on an, on a typewriter uh, that they have in their home. And the notes were designed to demoralize the German soldiers. Mm. So these were notes that were written in German because Suzanne was fluent in German. She had had a, a German-speaking nanny uh, or governess that had hel- who'd helped raise her when she was young. So she spoke uh, German fluently. So right. they were able to write these notes. And the notes took different forms. Some of them were, were jokes. Um, some of them were sort of dialogues of converse, you know, uh, fictional conversations between German soldiers. Uh, Mm -hmm. some of them were kind of more manifestos, but they were all written in German. And so they were aimed at the German soldiers, um, and they would write these notes and they would slip them into the pockets of German soldiers, or they would leave them on a cafe table, or they would stick them into a German language magazine at the newsstand where the Germans might, uh, you know, purchase this and and take it back and read it. Mm -hmm. Um, or they would, um, put them through mail slots or uh, any, any place that they could find, to pop one of these notes where some where one of the soldiers might find it and the hope was that it would sort of get inside of their heads that it would force them to kind of think about what they were doing and that um, you know I mean I think their ultimate goal was to try to convince the Germans to leave which is a pretty big goal right. uh, <laughs> when you think right. about it but even if they I mean I think at some level they knew they couldn't do that but they that but the way they talked about it was that even if they, even if the Germans weren't going to go home, mm-hmm. they at the very least were sort of forcing them to think about what they were doing and that that right. was enough in some ways for them, I think. Well, you made the point earlier that in the 1920s and the early 1930s of Paris, I mean, their work was literally their their goal was literally to get people to think, think outside the lines, think outside the norm, you know, that kind of stuff. And now it's being used because you can't just write a note that says, hey, German soldier, quit being anti-Semitic. That's not going to do anything. But if you can write something else that either raises doubts or, you know, you put the onus back on the person, hey, you're fighting, but Hitler's the one that's getting all the glory or getting rich or whatever. And But it's something where you truly try, and it's passive, I get that, but you're trying to make whoever picks it up and read it, trying to get them to think. Right. And, and that's really the key to what they were trying to do. Lucy had actually talked about this in a, an essay that she wrote back in Paris, um, mm-hmm. where she talked about this idea that she called the indirect effect. Right. And basically it was sort of a, and she didn't again, know that this would be applicable to the, to the wartime situation <laughs> at the time, right. but she was writing it more about her, her own writing and her own artwork. Um, but it was based this principle that, that, yeah, you can't really challenge someone directly that you have to be indirect. You have to sort of plant a seed, plant an idea, something that's going to get them to think, you know, in a, along a different line. Right. And if you do that, then that can, it may take a while, but that that will have a kind of, um, you know, a, a, a way of getting inside of their head and, and kind of rewiring mm-hmm. their thinking. And so that, that kind of idea that she had had a number of years before the war even starts um, is something, that's what they end up putting into practice. I think the other thing about their work that's really um, remarkable is that they, the notes that they write, most of the notes uh, end up being written not only in German, but from the perspective of a German soldier. So they actually take on the identity oh, of right. a German soldier. Uh, they call themselves, they, they sign these notes with this kind of fictional persona. They call him the soldier with no name. Mm-hmm. So they don't, they don't give him a name, 
Um, and they, they have discussions about how, what to call him and, you know, this persona that they've created. But they, they basically they're kind of invoking the idea of the unknown soldier. Um, right. And that was a very powerful idea across Europe and, of course, in the United States after World War I. Uh, but it was especially powerful in Germany. And so I think they knew, they understood that the, the idea of the unknown soldier – um, you know, going back to the trenches of World War I um, was something that could really kind of speak to the to the to the soldiers that they were writing toward to. Um, right. And also the idea then that um, that if this really was somebody from within the German ranks, that was the other part of it. If this is with somebody from within the German ranks, then somebody reading that note might say, hey, you know, one of one of my fellow soldiers is thinking this. Exactly. You know, and yeah. if that's the case, then maybe, you know, what's going on? You know, is there a conspiracy? Is there a some something I don't know about that, you know, somebody else does know? Um, and so that's that was another way to kind of play with the thinking um, and to, to get inside the skin and inside the heads of the of the soldiers. Yeah. And so um, the response that you just gave re- reminded me of that one line in your book, and, and, it, and it's an important distinction. This is not propaganda. This is psyops. This is psychology. This is something else. But it's not just simply lying to your enemy to try to get them to believe something. This is literally messing with the minds of the people who have control over you. That's right. I think it's, um, it, and I talk about it as a psyops campaign. And what, one mm-hmm. of the things that was interesting to me as I was doing the research for the book, I was also able to look at documents from the Allied PsyOps Division. And um, the, the the title of the book, Paper Bullets, actually comes from a document that I found from Allied PsyOps. Right. Um, it was a, a training manual that they were using to talk about, to, to explain to soldiers who were who were dropping leaflets behind German lines, um, you know, why this was an effective form of warfare. Mm-hmm. And in that, in one of these, uh, this training manual, it, it used the phrase paper bullets to, to describe what was happening. And so Lucy and Suzanne were not, they were not connected to this allied psyops campaign. They, as far right. as I know, they didn't know anything about it, but they had kind of come up with their own version of it um, independently. <laughs> yeah. And I looked at some of those allied psyops pamphlets and in some ways they were very similar. They were doing some of the same kinds of things, trying to convince German soldiers that the war was a lost cause. There was no reason for you to be here. You should surrender. You should go home, back to your family. They, they invoked family a lot. Lucy and Suzanne did this as well, mm-hmm. um, saying to soldiers, you know, should, shouldn't you be at home with your family? Um, you know, a real man would be at home taking care of his wife, taking care of his children, oh, rather than over here, um, you know, occupying this innocent country. So yeah. they, they tried to, to play every different emotional button, you know, push every emotional button that they could, as a way to, you know, again, to, to, to force people to really kind of reconsider, you know, what are our goals here? What are we doing here? Exactly. And, and you explain this in the book where they use the typewriter and other materials in different ways to try to make it look like these different various paper bullets, these notes, whatever, are coming from many, many different people, not just the same two women sitting in their house working on this old typewriter. So they even factored that in to try to give it this much larger impression of what's going across the island. That's right. They would sometimes, um, you you know, type some notes with a sort of lighter touch and some with a heavier touch to make it Mm -hmm. look like, you know, different typewriters were producing the notes. Um, Occasionally they would, they would write in other languages. They had found some 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 texts that had sort of side by side translations with with uh, Czech, for example, and right. so they would sort of try to figure out how to s- express the same things in in the Czech language, and in order to make some of the markings, the diacritical markings and the accents and things, they would use the the keys on the typewriter in different ways. Um, <laughs> sometimes even having to put the paper in upside down to make the right <laughs> mark. Um, right. And uh, and then they would also type these kind of these meaningless codes, I mean, to them, they were meaningless, just random series of letters and numbers. Mm-hmm. But the hope was that it would look like a secret code. It would look like some something that uh, an intelligence operative had, you know, was trying to pass to the allies or something. Again, right. it was all, all about deception, um, but deception with a purpose, you know, and that purpose being to, you know, to, to make the Germans think that that there was more going on here than they realized, um, that there was, you know, traitors within the ranks or that there was, you know, someone was communicating with the allies or something was going on and that one way or the other, we, we should really question why we're here on this island in the first place. 
Right. So you have these two women. They obviously have a lot of free time because they have money. They don't have to work. They, they sit in their house and they make up these notes. And then I guess they would go out during the day shopping, dropping it into a pocket or a hat or a wine bar, you know, just dropping them all over the place. You've got to think eventually someone's going to bring this to the notice of the Germans and they're going to have to put someone on it who can, you know, begin to Sherlock Holmes this thing and figure out what in the heck is going on. Exactly, and they and they do. They the um, the secret field police, which was the the uh, the police agency that was uh, oversaw occupied territories, and they were certainly mm-hmm. there on Jersey. So this is not SS, but this is military uh, military field police. They um, they started finding these notes, um, and they kept them, and they logged them, and they. <laughs> They tried to they 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 noted you know where they were found and right. um, and to try to to figure out what was going on because from their perspective and the, the main person here was Cap- a man named Captain Boda um, he was the head of the secret field police and Boda um, you know his, his big concern was maintaining order on this strategically important island you know this uh-huh. again was the Atlantic Wall. Um, you know, and as I mentioned in the book, you know, Hitler was receiving regular updates on the status of the of the Atlantic Wall of these fortifications because it was so important. So this was not a place where you wanted to have any kind of disorder or dissent or anything going on. So right. Boda had a big mission, and that was to keep order on the island. So finding notes like this, as he did for several years, because <laughs> they started this early on in the war, and so this right. this went on until so for basically for four years. You know, uh, he he was really I mean, I can't say exactly what he was thinking or feeling because I don't have any documents from his point of view. But I can only imagine that he was pretty worried about this because um, this was something you know, demoralizing troops was a was a was a uh, an executable offense. I mean, that was something that was was serious of undermining morale. And so um, uh, and so he, you know, was was basically hunting them for four years to try to figure out who was leaving these notes and whether it was anybody from within the German ranks, because obviously that would have been uh, that would have been treason. So um, so it was something that I, 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 I'm i sure that the Germans took seriously. I, or I know they took seriously because they, like I said, they looked for four years wow. uh, to, to try to find out who was doing this. Yeah. I'm not saying that um, the captain wasn't good at his job, but they were obviously the two the two women, Lucy and Suzanne, were very good at getting these notes out there and not getting caught because three and a half or four years is a long time to get away with resisting, you know? So again, it's amazing. Right. And I I think, uh, yeah, that they were, they were better at their job than than he was at theirs, I guess. Um, (laughs) But I think it also speaks to the fact that they, they were working alone, just the two of them. Um, they were not uh, involved with any other oh. groups. And there were other people on Jersey who were engaged in resistance activities. I mean, the, on the Channel Islands, uh, there was there was definitely homegrown resistance. It wasn't connected to anything off the island. There was not connected mm-hmm. to the French resistance or any other organized resistance groups because they couldn't. They couldn't communicate. They couldn't connect. Right. Um, but um, so it was all very small scale and very local. But Lucy and Suzanne did not – be, they were not involved with any of the other resistance uh, activity on the island, um, and l- in large part that was because they they were used to working alone and they they just yeah. wanted to do it on their own, and they were they didn't want to risk anybody else. They didn't want to put anybody else's life at risk. Now they did have a maid, uh, and they did have a and her husband. The two of them lived in the house with Lucy mm-hmm. and Suzanne. It was a big house, and so the, her, uh, their their maid's name was Edna. And her husband's name was George, and they were sort of caretakers um, of the house. So they were they were sort of putting these two people at risk a little bit because um, you know right. they were living in the same house. But but they also shielded Edna and George. They didn't tell them what was going on. They didn't uh, they didn't reveal this. Uh, so you know if if they heard the typewriter, you know in the middle of the night, they could just remind Edna and George. Well, Lucy's a writer. You know that's oh, what she's, yes. she's just writing. You know it's a cover. That's right. There was gotcha. only one person that they told. There was a. They had a friend, a long-term friend, named Edna, who, uh, uh, or excuse me, Vera. Um, mm-hmm. They told Vera, their friend, um, that they were doing this. But um, Vera was also kind of a loner. She also, um, you know, uh, she didn't. She didn't tell anybody. Um, and so, uh, so really, they were. They were basically acting completely independently. Right. So. W- 
and this is very important because what we're going to do is we're not going to give away the end of the story because we want your listeners to <laughs> check that out for yourself. But I do want to build up the tension because what I enjoyed very much about this book was in the middle of it, as I'm reading, I obviously don't know that this cat and mouse game is going to go on for four years, you know, because again, who's going to be able to keep operating like that under the very noses of the Germans and get away with it. So the point is, so this tension is building up and every time they go out to make some of their drops, you just know when you turn the next page that, aha, the Germans are going to get them. So what I want to do just to give the readers an idea of some of the tension that's building up during this four years is I'm going to get, I'm going to mention a couple things. And if I could get you to comment on them, I think if we just list a couple of them, I really think that would help the listeners uh, kind of get a sense of what's going on in the middle of the book, because it's, it's, they've already started, but yet it's not the end. And so it's that, it's that part in the middle that uh, sometimes doesn't get appreciated. So first of all, if I remember correctly, the Germans do bring slave labor on to the island, and so the women do see truly what the uh, the Germans are capable of. That's right, and one of the slave labor camps is actually just down the road from their house. Mm. So the trucks pass by their house, um, and they talk about this, that, that some of the men from the slave labor camp, and these are men and, and, and boys even, teen, right. teenagers, who are brought from the East, um, some from Russia, from Poland, elsewhere. Um, they're there to they're there to to, for, to build these fortifications for the Atlantic Wall. This is part right. of the, the the work that they are being forced to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, it turns out that on at least a few occasions, the men are out on the beach right in front of Lucy and Suzanne's house. Right. And so they go out there and they try to talk to these men, mm-hmm. and um, they you know and they, uh, they try to give them some give them some food or give them, uh, you know, uh, uh, there was a pair of socks that Lucy gave to one of them, you know, right. just anything to try to help these men who they realized, uh, you know, were in a, in a horrible situation. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, then on other occasions, there, there were actually sometimes men who would escape from the slave labor camps and would end up being sheltered by local Jersey families. Again, right. other, other people were involved, not just Lucy and Suzanne, but, but there was one in particular who, um, spent some time in one of their little outbuildings uh, right behind their house mm-hmm. and uh, and lived there. I don't know exactly how long, but at least a few weeks. Um, and so um, so they certainly understood the, the brutality. I mean, there was not the kind of brutality that you'd see in the East. I mean, you know, the, the, the islands right. were, were not experiencing the kind of violence there, but um, but they certainly witnessed how the the slave laborers were being treated. Um, they certainly saw the the um, you know the, at least that that aspect of the the bluntness um, of the of the German rule. Right, and there was also uh, a certain number of deportations where you didn't know if you were going to be grabbed up at any you know whether you were truly guilty of something or if they just thought you were. I mean, it was possible for these two young ladies to be just grabbed up and taken off the island. Right. There were, there were a couple of rounds of deportations. Um, and, uh, and there were people from Jersey who ended up in prison camps, uh, and all, the other channel islands as well and prison camps. Uh, and, and even a few who, who went to the death camps, um, not right. a huge number, but there were a few who did. Um, but those deportations, um, yeah, it was, it was very unclear. There was a little bit of a slapdash quality to them in some ways, but, um, but it certainly created a lot of uncertainty. And there were times that Lucy and Suzanne, they didn't know what was going to happen. In fact, they, they would later on say, uh, later in the right. war, they would say, you know, we didn't really expect to survive the war. Yes. I mean, they were pretty blunt about it. Right. Um, and I think that it was because, A, they were taking such big risks, mm-hmm. but also because there was this kind of, this kind of ongoing uncertainty about what was going to happen. So when they would see deportations or when they would see the slave la- slave laborers or see other things going right. on, you know, there was just a big question mark about what tomorrow would bring. And so I think that they basically expected every day to hear a fist pounding on their door, um, you know, and, and for them to be taken away. But they, they didn't know when or if it would come. Right. And that reminds me when they were going around dropping their notes. And at one point, uh, we don't have to go into this, but they get so good at what they do, they actually create an entire fake magazine. Uh, but again, if you want to talk about that, you can. But as they were going around dropping their notes, they carried around a certain substance with them 
Uh, it might have been in a blue bottle. I'm trying to remember, but That's they right. were they were ready. They were ready. They were. It was. They carried a, a, a milk of magnesia bottle, mm-hmm. um, which did not contain milk of magnesia. Right. Uh, instead, it contained gardenol, which was a, a barbiturate, um, and it was an overdose. And they had they had learned from some medical students um, what the right dosage would be, uh. so that uh, if they needed to, uh, if they were caught, or if they, you know, if it was an emergency and they needed to commit suicide, um, that they could do it. And so they always had. So that when they went out. Uh, on their on their missions to drop mm-hmm. notes, uh, they would often wear these big Burberry overcoats, um, and they had big big deep pockets, and so they would stuff those notes down in the pockets. But always in the bottom of one of one of their pockets right. was this l- little blue bottle um, that looked like it had medicine, but actually had uh, had a uh, barbiturate, had overdose um, that they could take. Well, they the uh, just that determined, and of course, it's hard to, to beat an enemy or an adversary that's that's that determined. Uh, can I get you to describe one more psyops, if you will? Uh, the banner that read "Jesus is great, but Hitler is greater." Right. It's a it's a testament, in some ways, to their dark humor. A lot of their right. notes actually use a lot of dark humor. <laughs> right. Um, and they paint this banner. I, it's not clear how they got a hold of the paint, but um, <laughs> or or the cloth for that matter, the the canvas, you know, the right. big piece of cloth that they used to paint it on. But but they paint it, they roll it up, and uh, they they take it to the church, which is really just a, a couple hundred meters from their house. I mean, it's very it's right there. Right. Uh, and I've, I've been to these places. I've been to their house. I've been to the church, um, and so I can I can imagine. You know, it, it probably was heavy, and it probably took them you know a little bit of work to do, but. Um, but it was a short trip to the church, uh, and they uh, hung it up over the altar. Wow. And it was a church where, like many of the churches on the island, where German soldiers were worshiping. Um, mm. And in fact, the, the churchyard, the cemetery, was that, that was the cemetery where German soldiers who, had, who died during the occupation, for whatever reason, sometimes for medical reasons or whatever, um, that's where they were being buried, in that very churchyard. Um, and this was adjacent to their property. So they could mm-hmm. literally look across and see any German uh, funerals that were going on. Right. But uh, so in this in inside the church itself, they hung this banner. And I, to me, it's a it's a really sort of dark joke, because what they're essentially saying is that, you know, um, you know, Jesus is great, but Hitler is greater because Jesus died for people, but mm-hmm. people die for Hitler. And so it's another uh, way for them to say to soldiers, like, who are you really dying for? Who are yeah. you who are you sacrificing yourself for? You're sacrificing yourself for Hitler. Right. And it's an, a way of saying, you know, you've been duped. You've been fooled. Um, you've been you've been deceived. And I think a lot of their notes strike that kind of tone of yeah. trying to say to the soldiers, you are you are being fooled. And I, I think for them, it's kind of a way to reach out to those soldiers. And even, and this is a, I think kind of a, 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 it's hard for us to think about it this way, but I think that they're trying, they see themselves as trying to rescue these soldiers. Um, because I think they, they have sympathy for the soldiers because their brothers and and cousins had served in world war one. And so they, they say, you know, we know what soldiers are like. Um, Mm -hmm. and so they understood the humanity of these soldiers, even though they disagreed with, Nazism and disagreed with the occupation. Obviously, they still understood that these were men, um, and that they were they were they were they were human beings. And I think that they wanted to somehow reach out to them and say, you know, leave this behind and come back to the rest of humanity. Right. Um, and I think a banner like that, as well as a lot of the notes, were an attempt to try to. That's where that that uh, indirect effect, that provocative way of thinking, really came in. And, and just in case uh, I haven't done a good enough job, I apologize. We're not just talking about a few notes. I mean, they were able to make several at one time. And like you said, this went on for four years. And so when the Germans finally do find out who's doing this and they arrest these two ladies, like you said, the Germans have a collection of the papers. But I'm, I'm beginning to think that they have a very small percentage of the work produced by Lucy and Suzanne. That's right. They they have about at, at the trial when they're put on trial by the Germans, they have about 300 or so, 350 of the of the notes. Right. But they get during interrogation, they get asked, you know, how many notes did you produce? And neither of them had been counting. And so sure. 
you know, they they sort of say, oh, well, that's only about a, a third of what we did or that's only about a quarter of what we did. <laughs> right. And it doesn't you know, the exact number is unknowable to us now. But but undoubtedly, it had to be hundreds and hundreds of these notes, because it's true that they were often um, because they were using very thin paper. Mm-hmm. Um, where they could put maybe 10 or 12 sheets into the typewriter at once and hit oh. the key hard enough that it would make an impression on on multiple sheets of paper at once. And so if they were doing, you know, some of these notes in duplicates or, or not even duplicates, but, you know, multiples right. um, and, and sometimes typing and retyping the same message over and over again, um, then, you know, I, I can only speculate how many notes they ended up producing. But I mean, it, it certainly hundreds and hundreds of notes. It could, it could have been even thousands. It's, it's right. really unknowable. I guess that brings up the good point. If, if you're one of the commanding officers and you go, so you're telling me we've only got one third of their notes. Does that mean a whole bunch of German soldiers have been finding these notes for years and not turning them in? I mean, it, it, it might scare the leadership to know that that's true. I think that's right. I, I think, you know, some soldiers undoubtedly just toss them away, right. um, perhaps out of anger or perhaps out of fear that if, oh, if, if somebody finds this note on me, you know, I'm going to be myself put in prison. Right. Um, and uh, but it but it, it does beg the question, you know, what happened to all these notes? <laughs> if, uh, you know, if they if they were putting them in the pockets of soldiers or you know, leaving them around and, the, and soldiers were finding them, you know, maybe the message was getting through at least to, to a few people. Right. So this is where the story obviously turns a little dark because they are arrested. They are questioned. The Germans have uh, evidence on them. Uh, But we're going to save that for the readers. Uh, But if I could end on a semi light note, could you just share the moment with us in your book where Lucy is being sentenced or she's she's being questioned and it gets to the point where she's actually I don't know what the proper term is. Is she mocking the judge? Is she baiting the judge i don't know but there's a there's a moment where her defiance shines through even to the german judge who's who's you know got control of her life right and and actually i would expand and say both of them it's not just mm. lucy but suzanne okay. as well because um uh suzanne is the one who's fluent in german and the trial is being conducted in german right and so suzanne was really the one who was speaking for both of them lucy spent much of the trial sort of looking around and trying to figure out what was going on. There was a translator uh, who, was tra- who was offering a kind of very loose translation of what was going on. But, right. um, but, uh, but and that was part of the issue that, that when, when Suzanne, or excuse me, when Lucy heard the, the, the sentence mm-hmm. that was uh, rendered against them, she, she was, started asking questions. And I think it was a little bit of both, partly confusion, but also partly a kind of you know, like you got to be kidding me, kind of thing. You know, like, uh, and she, and I think she was giving them some pushback. But Suzanne had been doing the same thing too, and in fact, throughout the trial, where um, you know she, th- there was there were, throughout the entire trial, Suzanne basically, again speaking for both of them, mm-hmm. says, "Yep, we did it. We we are not hiding it. We have no right. desire to try to fool you. You know, yes, we completely confess to this." Um, and then kind of, kind of offer justification, you know, and to say, you know, well, we were defending ourselves, you know, why, yeah. why you wouldn't do anything differently. Um, and so there are these there are, there are other moments of the trial that are kind of funny. But but that moment of sentencing, I think, like I said, partly Lucy's attitude, but partly also her confusion at what's going on. Mm-hmm. And I think it frustrates the Germans because they you know, the Germans expect them to take this very seriously. Yes. Um, and instead, I mean, it's not that they don't take it seriously. I think they do. But it comes across. And it certainly in the sources to me came across as a kind of strangely lighthearted moment. You know, sentencing shouldn't be a lighthearted moment. But right. but in a funny way for them, it sort of was because, you know, they expected it all along and they uh, uh, and they were willing to kind of play with the Germans at, at every step along the way. I think it was I think even in that trial, they were still trying to get inside the minds of the wow. soldiers. Yeah. Now, like you said earlier, they do expect, how should I put this, not to survive the war. Once they take up their cause of paper bullets, of course they're not expecting to survive. And they have been tried. They are condemned to die. But obviously the times have changed a lot since the Channel Islands were first occupied back in 1940. So 
Again, we'll save that for the uh, for the Raiders. I'm not trying to be frustrating to you, leaders, <laughs> readers, but trust me, it's it's definitely worth going in and finishing up the book because we have left a lot out. So, uh, Professor Jackson, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for being with us today. And I think you did tell me in one of the emails that there was MI-19 declassified documents used in this as far as diary, diary entries and, and other things. Obviously, that's, I'm guessing... All that was critical to helping you weave the story together. That's right. There were a lot of different types of sources that I used. Um, some of them were were Lucy's uh, uh, words. Some of them were Suzanne's. Um, but then there were also other types of documents, including MI-19 documents um, and other sources that I was able to have access to. And so, um, you know, even though it like I said, other people have told bits and pieces of the story. I think one reason that it hasn't been told as fully is yeah. because I think I'm the first person to really try to cast a wide net and really look at as many sources as possible to, to really tell the full story. Um, and that's what I've really tried to do. Yeah, I think you're right, because when I got your book, I started looking for other books on the same subject, and you're absolutely right. I got parts, a uh, little bit in Paris and parts on the island, but not the wider story. So I'm I'm glad you took the time to put this together. Uh, Paper Bullets, the two artists who risked their lives to defy the Nazis, is out now. It's also available on Audible. I certainly do recommend that. And Professor Jackson, before I let you go, because I have done enough of these interviews to know that somebody is going to take your book and make a movie of it. And when they do, you call me. I'll drive your car. I'll, I'll carry your luggage. But I've, I've already missed out on too many location shoots, and I want to be a part of the next one. Okay. Well, that's that's very kind of you. Thank you. And I, I you know, that would be nice. I, I certainly hope that uh, someone will will take that project up because it. It's a it's an amazing and compelling story. And I've had many people say to me, like, oh, this really needs to be a movie or a Netflix series or something like that. Exactly. So we'll see. We'll see. Exactly. Okay. Don't, so you're not promising me, but you're not going to forget me, right? That's okay. right. That's, That's right. You're I'm on the asking. list. <laughs> so, Professor Jackson, thank you very much for your time today and for this book. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's been a great conversation. Thank you. Nature's always finding ways to support life like elderberries. Nature's Way extracted the best of the berry, tossed in vitamins C and D and zinc, and put them into Sambuca's gummies. Powerful immune support inspired by nature. Nature's Way.